Welcome to episode number 42 of Foreign Object. Friends, we are now at a dangerous tipping point in America today. What the hell am I talking about? I'm talking about Islamophobia. One time hyperbole be damned, I believe the anti-Muslim rhetoric in this country is akin to the anti-Muslim hysteria that was emblematic of Serbian society in the years prior to the country's genocidal activities in neighbouring Bosnia in the early 90s. When Serbia's Slobodan Milosevic wished to annex Bosnia-Herzegovina by cleansing the former Yugoslavia state of its Muslim population, he depicted Serbia as a fortress defending European culture and religion from the Islamic world. It took Milosevic nearly three years of relentless anti-Muslim propaganda to prime the Serbians for na secular nationalistic violence against Bosnian Muslims. For the past decade or more, Americans, like the Serbs of the 80s and 90s, have been subject to relentless anti-Muslim propaganda. The events of the, week, the, of the past week alone represent a dangerous new high watermark. On Tuesday, we were introduced to Ahmed Mohammed, a 14-year-old Muslim boy who was arrested for building a clock which amounts to nothing less than an extreme act of racial ethnic profiling. Yesterday at a Trump rally in New Hampshire, an attendee said the following, quote, We have a problem in this country. It's called Muslims. The man then added, quote, we, have a we have training camps growing where they want to kill us. That's my question. When can we get rid of them? That's as close as a call for ethnic cleansing one could ever hope not to hear. But these events are the byproduct and the fruits of those who have spent the post-9-11 years portraying Islam as, in quote, in quote, inherently violent. I think you know where I'm going with this. Yes, I'm blaming the Islamophobia industry, and you, can blame, and you can't blame the Islamophobia industry without blaming new atheism itself. For celebrity new atheists have spent the past decade or so enriching themselves with slogans, while spouting slogans, talking points, and chants borrowed from a cadre of groups who seek to provide political cover for both America's war on terror and Israel's war on the Palestinians. Interesting, these wars have now pitted progressives against new atheists. I maintain that one cannot ascribe to the fascistic anti-Muslim narratives of the new atheist movement while at the same time considering him or herself a progressive. Liberalism has a very specific meaning, of which we might and hope to delve into later. My next guest, however, feels that the ideological gulf separating the likes of yours truly, Glenn Greenwald, Cenk Ugar, Reza Aslan, Noam Chomsky, from the likes of Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Hersey Ali and Jerry Coyne, is narrower than I might believe. Kyle Kalinske is a host of the extremely popular online show, Secular Talk. He is the secular movement's number one shock jock. He is Howard Stern without the porn stars, and I count myself <laughs> as one of Kyle's fans. He is one smart dude. He's a clear thinker, which, which is why I am, I'm very privileged to have him with me here now. Kyle, welcome to Foreign Object, mate. Hey, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. I think we'll have a, a good conversation. Yeah, for sure. I, I got no doubt we will, mate. I just, uh, I guess, I wanted to start by talking about your recent episode, uh, which was titled "New Atheist First Progressives." And um, oh, right, the ceasefire video, right? The ceasefire video, exactly. Yeah, mate, which was superb. I mean, uh, and, and as you, as you, you put a disclaimer up front there. You, you uh, predicted you were fail, and I hope you, you know, I think you'd be on enough, <laughs> honest enough to admit that you have failed. But, oh, of course, of course. <laughs> But uh, props for trying, my man. But um, so, so break it down from uh, break down that episode for my listeners. Okay, so I mean, the general idea behind it is that I th think when it comes to progressives versus uh, new atheists, if you actually go very specifically political issue uh, by political issue, you find that probably on over eighty percent of the issues, there's complete and utter agreement. And my point wasn't really to say that, you know, you guys should stop talking about where you disagree. It's more of me saying, hey, we should all acknowledge that on at least 80% of the stuff we do agree. So, you know, making that point is another way of saying, I don't think it's fair or r rational to treat somebody like Richard Dawkins like he's akin to, to Dick Cheney. Because even if you listen to his own words, whatever he's accused of of you know being in league with those clowns he says that's ridiculous like and just to give you one example here um a lot of people were going after my well why don't you tweet i stand with ahmed and then they did and then people still went after them it's like well what do you want them to do then they're they're, they're actually uh, agreeing so and look again that's not to say that we, uh, i personally don't have areas where i disagree with them anybody who's familiar with my work knows i do but i like to think that i, I try to keep my my disagreements in perspective and i don't like to to uh, generalize about them. Well, and, and just on that, you know, my problem with the um, uh, with Dawkins and Harris coming out and uh, including the I stand with Ahmed 
is to me it just smacks of wanton hypocrisy because these are you know uh, these are guys who have, have painted and portrayed Islam as inherently violent, and when you portray Islam as inherently violent, or or, or as Dawkins called Islam the world's greatest evil today, well this kid was treated like uh, he was a member of that group which is supposed to be evil. He was prejudged to be evil, wasn't he? Well, would you rather them have not said it though? That's my question. Well, I'm would you rather them have not said, I stand with Ahmed, because then obviously they would have continued to get shit if they didn't do it, and then now that they did do it, they're still getting shit. So it really is a case of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Fair point. Fair point. And, uh, and, and, and I'm glad they did it, but uh, you know, I still can't get beyond the, the hypocrisy. Now, w one of the things you talk about in, um, in, that, in that clip is you, you lump, um, or you criticize progressives of lumping new atheists in with the likes of Rush Limbaugh and Ann Coulter and Glenn Beck and Sarah Palin. Right. Um, but the way I see it, certainly just specifically when it comes to Islam and Muslims, it, there's, uh -huh. there really is no difference between the Christian right and New Atheism. Now, you know, while the former might ha hates Muslims because they think they're satanic, New Atheists hate Muslims because <laughs> they think they're barbaric. And I mean, and they get to it, they get the conclusions in a different way. And, uh, and, and that's one of the, I guess, the, the, uh, the myths my new book kind of dispels, that, right. that this New Atheist fabricated myth that people like Harris and Hersey Ali and co., are concerned with criticizing religious texts and ideas. No, they engage in demagoguery, they engage in negative stereotypes, and they engage in hysterical fear-mongering. They warn of a Muslim tide like the Nazis warned of a, of a Jewish tide. And, and on, substance, on substance, the only difference between the claims made against Muslims by Harris and, say, Ann Calder and Glenn Beck, is that later don't put backdoor caveats at the end of their heinous remarks that they can kind of wiggle out of when they get shit-piled on them. What do you, what do you say to that? But wouldn't you say that uh, – because I, I talk to s these kinds of people every day where I would say the majority of people we might describe as new atheists are actually huge fans. Fans of like Noam Chomsky as well, and you know I put myself in that category. I'm the I'm a guy who's read, for example, Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion, and I'm a guy who's read Noam Chomsky' Hegemony or Survival, and I'm a guy who walked away from both of those books going, hmm, those were some fair points made in both of them. <laughs> now again, we can point to specific areas where I I vehemently disagree with each individual uh, new atheist, but I, I ironically I think you're you might be a little guilty of the same thing that some new atheists might be guilty of when they you know kind of generalize about. Muslims, I think that you might be generalizing a little bit about new atheists because I speak to a lot of these new atheists, uh, you know, all the time, and they're actually they they feel like upset that they're being lumped in in with uh, an ideology that they don't necessarily agree with. See, I think the real dichotomy, CJ, is this: mm -hmm. conservative atheists versus you know non-conservative atheists or progressives. I think that's the real you know dividing line, if you will. Because I do think a majority of people who've read all the different uh, New Atheist books are actually left-leaning. Mm. But um, I, I see all the time um, uh, those atheists who identify with progressive politics uh, really get behind or, and certainly never criticize or call out um, any of the heinous remarks made by um, uh, Harrison Dawkins. And they constantly defend... Those who criticize them as constantly misrepresenting them, constantly taking them out of context, even though when someone like myself and Greenwald and Aslan, we quote them in full. Um, and, 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 I, and, and I always get well, this. Well, we we'd have to get into specifics on that one, I okay. think, because I think there are some examples. And not willful. I don't think anybody's willfully you know, misquoted them or anything. Sure. But I think there are examples of you know, misperceptions and stuff like that. Like, for example, the recent thing with PZ Myers, uh, where he said that, Glenn, that uh, Sam Harris would didn't want uh, you know people to, to search people or profile people like Jerry Seinfeld. That's actually not what he said. He said literally Jerry Seinfeld. He thinks it's a waste of time for you know whatever for security apparatus to to search literally Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> and that that obviously is a much much fairer point than saying oh he's against looking at searching people who look like Jerry Seinfeld because then the implication would be well he doesn't want to look at like middle-aged white men he wants to look at only brown-skinned white men you see what i'm saying so sure i i think you you have to you'd have to get into the to the details of uh, of each individual thing there yeah and and this is you know i guess a lot of um uh, new atheists who are critical of 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 critics of the new atheist celebrity new atheists I kind of hung up on those few issues, like the profiling, uh, the nuclear first strike stuff. Um, yeah, if if you want, torture. man, we could go. We 
could go through one by one, and I'll tell you specifically where I agree and where I disagree. Um, I like, for example, I have I have pretty significant, in fact, really really significant disagreements uh, with a guy like Sam Harris when it comes to Israel Palestine. You know, I have uh, I do think that he's a, a little light on the foreign policy now. And again, I, that's not to say that if you or I bring up to him specific examples of fucked up foreign policy that he wouldn't you know, agree with us. In fact, I think he does whenever he's like pushed on it enough. I think he does concede, but he, he is a little light on the foreign policy knowledge. So like, I have, I have disagreements with him, and anybody who knows the body of my work knows that. But I guess my, my, my main disagreement with you would just be this idea that uh, the dividing line is new atheists in general. I think that the real problem is Conserv- uber conservative atheists and I'm sure you and I can both point to uh, a, a lot of them online they certainly exist I just think that it's a it's a we get a misperception of just how big it is because they're really loud and really vocal yeah but but uh, again coming to that is 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 I'm not con- I'm not so much concerned in those those specific instances the nuclear flow strike and the torture and um, mm-hmm. and the profiling um, right. uh, you know I I'm sure we you know I I have a, a fairly strong I mean you know, on profiling, Harris said we should profile Muslims or anyone conceivably looks like Muslims. And whatever asterisks or caveat you put behind that, and I think his asterisks and caveat behind that was, well, you should profile me as well. But that doesn't change what you're really trying to say here. You're trying to whip up a fear, again, of Muslims. And, and again, it's not these little differences that Harris says. I couldn't be interested in less than that. It's the overall sentiment of what he pushes forward, which is very dangerous. It's no difference to what the Serbs were doing. It's uh, against Muslims. It's no difference to what the Nazis were doing against Jews in, um, you know, in the 1930s. And it's this whole pushing of the Muslims are coming. They're but you, com- but, you, would, but they- you wouldn't say that he's like, he's, he's I mean, the, with the comparisons you're making, you know, it leaves the taste that people think that you're saying he's genocidal, which obviously no. you wouldn't say that. No, which... I w- no, I wouldn't say it at all. Yeah. Uh, okay. no, no, but... but uh, but when you start with this, that the, from that starting point, um, he I mean, he's engages in tries to engage in intellectual uh, c- uh, conversation. He's not just a you know. I don't think he's a raving at a rabid at the mouth um, mm-hmm. a lunatic. I don't even believe. I don't. I believe he doesn't even believe how dangerous it is the things he's saying. Like for example, the stuff I'm more concerned about is when he buys into these Islamophobic industry generated conspiracy theories like the Arabian conspiracy theory and he talks about the uh, you know uh, he he regurgitates that conspiracy theory in his book the letters to a christian nation where he forecasts that by 2025 uh, france could be a muslim majority country if current immigration rates continue well current immigration continued rates have exceeded what they were when he wrote that book in 2007 or 2008 around about that time but he wrote that with a very specific purpose the muslims are coming and we need to be afraid um and that projection is going to be somewhere between 50 to 250 years um, out. Now, that is no difference to the Jewish tide, I think the the Juntung, I think was the German word, that they used uh, in the early 1930s. So Europe's going to be overtaken by, you know, know, Jewish migration, and we're going to lose our, our Western European values to, you know, this Jewish influx. There's no difference between those two narratives. So let me ask you then, at, at what kind of criticisms, because one of the uh, the charges leveled against you is that, well, you crossed the line on flat out, you know, Islamist, uh, being an Islamist apologist. What criticisms are, are fair where you would say, you know what, that's not a bigoted statement, that's not a, a bad statement, that's not a wrong statement. Like, for example, if I were to say, you know, as a percentage, there may be more uh, conservatives in the uh, Muslim community versus the Christian community today. Would you say that's a fair statement, or would you say no, that's a bigoted statement, and you can't even breach that conversation? Well, well in in, a, in America, I would say uh, a greater percentage of uh, Muslims. Uh, you know, if we can stick with Muslim Americans, a greater percentage of Muslim Americans are more secular. Uh, have a, a more secular. No, and than, and than, than and wait. And allow me to add on to that point. Yeah. When you poll the American Muslim community, they're actually they actually reject violence against civilians much more than the Christian community does. Hmm. Yeah. So there's no question. I mean, if you we, we could sit here and I could give you fact after fact that shows that the American Muslim community is perfectly <laughs> lovely. There's no doubt about that. Sure. But making the broader point worldwide, yeah, do, is it not a fair point to say something like? Because a guy like me, I'm flat out just concerned about conservatism, mm-hmm. whatever kind of conservatism it might be. I, yeah, hey, you, you, is it not a fair point for, for you, me to say something like, uh, I'm very concerned about conservative 
Muslim, Muslims, or would you say you can't even really breach that conversation because then it's a bigoted thing? No, absolutely. I would back, I would back you 100% on that. If, you, if, you're, if you're expressing a concern backed up with data that showed mm. that conservative Muslims in this country were uh, seriously wanting to implement Sharia law or seriously wanting to transform America's secular democracy into a tyrannical Islamic theocracy, mm. I, would, I would fight that. I would be on that fight. Um, okay, see, th and that's good. I think this is very important because I think a lot of people who listen to you, like the main charge that I've tried to fight back to defend you and to defend Glenn and to defend Jenk is I think it's ridiculous when people call you Islamist apologists <laughs> because what they're saying is, well, these guys, uh, you know, they kind of secretly might want Islamism <laughs> implemented. And I mean, if you listen to anything you've ever said or anything those guys have ever said, you consistently uh, have been on the side of, hey, I'm for gay marriage. Hey, I'm for civil liberties. Hey, I'm against intervention. Like all these different things, which are obviously the antithesis of political Islam. So, you know, I've defended you in that sense. But, um, yeah. yeah, I think that's uh, – I don't know. I, I think that uh, we have to be very careful and we have to be fair in understanding when somebody is primarily concerned about um, the doctrine or a poor interpretation of the doctrine versus the people. And I think that you can – I'm sure you could point to – and I could point to many examples of these new atheists you speak of that do generalize – but by and large, I think uh, guys like Sam and, and Richard Dawkins, for the most part, they are more concerned with doctrine and they are more concerned with, with ideas. And that's not to say I don't uh, – yeah, again, that's not to say I don't have major disagreements with them in many things. But you know, I, I think it might be a little unfair to, to tar them with that. I, I, but I, I would challenge that uh, their very uh, combative, anti-theistic worldview – uh, and then when they when they take that worldview and they look at Islam, it spills over then into holding dangerous views towards the people who hold those religious views that they oppose. I mean, I so mean, let's... Look, for example, you know, Harris says in his book, mm -hmm. the, on, the only world Muslims can envisage is one where non-Muslims are subjugated and killed. I mean, you know, that that's, you know, dangerous garbage at best, yeah. you know. So, so let's get into the idea of anti-theism because I think this is a really a good conversation for you and I to have. I, I've kind of maintained, like I, I've done segments in the past in defense of new atheism and defense of anti-theism, and my my version of anti-theism, the way I perceive anti-theism is just very simply, I'm against the religions because I think the religions are untrue. Would you concede that, you know, whoever might claim that there's more attached to that is wrong because I think a lot of people have recently came up with this idea that, well, anti-theism means you want to militaristically eradicate the religions. And I don't think that's anywhere near true. In fact, I've never spoken to a single anti-theist who said, yeah, let's all pick up some guns and try to kill all the religious people. But, but uh, history has proven, uh, and certainly the, the last century has proven, that anti-theism, whilst it might start at challenging religious doctrine and religious beliefs, then it transforms into violence at some point. And that's exactly what happened in Albania. It's exactly what happened in the Soviet Union and Cambodia. It's when anti-religious propaganda uh, campaigns were started to, to deconvert people from religion. The Soviet, if you look at, if you go in, uh, back in history and you, you read these books on anti-religious uh, propaganda, these are the same slogans that these new atheists use, that religion is, you know, a form of child abuse, religion is, you know, barbaric, religion, religion is going to give you brain cancer, religion is, you know, uh, whatever, you know. Um, yeah, but uh, CJ, I'm wanted. not... You want, I'm, not defending, of, I'm not defending untrue attacks against religion. I don't think I need untrue attacks against religion to say that it is incorrect. I'm in favor of using logic and reason and evidence to say, you know what? And I actually care about truth and I respect other people enough to say, I think you care about truth too. So I'm going to make a positive argument as to why I think people can be the, you know, non-religious. And unfortunately, I think that nowadays, a lot of times when people do that, they're immediately labeled as an extremist, which I think is a little ridiculous because we all know Whenever there's a Christian or whenever there's a Muslim, they're allowed to talk about their beliefs and, you know, it's, it's commonplace in society. It's almost like for the longest time, atheists have had to be quiet. Now they're finally speaking up and even other atheists are telling them, nah, nah sit down and shut up. Yeah, but there's a difference between speaking up and a difference between being um, uh, hostile and threatening and also using, uh, you know, uh, you know a, a, a rhetorical style, which has led to anti-religious genocides. In the past. But, but don't you see that – so if, if we accept that argument though, CJ, don't you see how 
that argument would even kneecap a guy like me who has no interest in doing violence in any way, shape, or form from making a, a rational argument against religious doctrine. Like, don't you see how if you invoke this slippery slope argument, well, this is the beginning and then eventually it ends in genocide, then I'm not allowed to do any of my segments where I just argue from a, from, you know, a, a perspective oh. of using logic that all the, the holy books are untrue. But, but, that, but that, that, that's a very uh, thinking, that's a very uh, uh, deliberate and irrational, uh, you know, um, a critique of whether you want to call it religious texts themselves or religion or whether there's an encroachment of secular, you know, uh, 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 the separation of church and state. But when you start, say, start calling these religions nihilistic cults of death, when you start calling them the mother loads of bad ideas, when you say that tens of millions of uh, Muslims are scarier than Dick Cheney, when you say Muslims are utterly deranged by their faith, uh, when you say that you know religion is the equivalent of smallpox but harder to eradicate and let's like AIDS and it's a cancer, well... What 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 lengths wouldn't you go to to get rid of it eventually if you really believe it's worse than I mean Ray Razlan made this point if you really believe that religion is, is worse than child abuse if you believe it's worse than rape if you believe it's worse than cancer if you believe it's worse than smallpox at what point then do people stop not everyone is going to think rationally and coolly like you Kyle there are fucking lunatics out there and we saw a lunatic in Trump's audience yesterday now. You can you can draw a very short leap between him saying the Muslims are here trying to kill us to Sam Harris's book the Muslims are trying to threaten the European continent and pose and subjugate and kill us. I mean, this, don't this, you this, don't this. wouldn't you concede though the same argument that you're making it can be made against the doctrine of Islam where there's obviously parts in the doctrine of Islam that talk about how you know the infidel should be killed and even if you say which is a fair point hey it all depends on the historical context they were talking about the pagans at the time yadi. Yada, like you just said to me, well, not everybody has a cool, calm, rational view of it, so that might lead to horrible things. Well, then the same argument can be made against, you know, all the different religious doctrines. Never mind, you know, arguments that are made by certain atheists today. Yeah, but if, but if you're going to criti you know, if you're going to criticize religious doctrine, at mm -hmm. least do it in an inter in a, in a intellectual way. And you know, for example, I've made this point numerous times. Um, if you read End of Faith. You know, uh, Sam Harris brings up 9-11. And then he explains the 9-11 uh, hijackers' motives by just ripping out six pages of the Quran, you know, kill the unbelievers, make the, you know, make hell, right. you know, fire so, home for him. And with, with no, with totally, de de you know, those texts totally decontextualize of the historical, cultural, and linguistic meaning because it doesn't mean those things that Harris is trying to, you know, say they do mean to justify why those al-Qaeda terrorists would have done what they did. Right, so let's get into this, because this is, I think, the, the heart of the disagreement between progressives and new atheists. I think progressives oftentimes want to point to uh, geopolitical and economic circumstances to explain where terrorism comes from. And I think that oftentimes uh, new atheists want to point to uh, doctrine to explain where terrorism comes from, religious doctrine. And I, I think there are plenty of cases that are solidly in both camps. And then I think the majority of cases are a mix of the two different factors. And I think the main disagreement that many new atheists would have with you is they feel like at times you're downplaying just the direct link from doctrine to action. Uh, and to give you an example of this, like you didn't hear anybody say that Kim Davis, who was denying gays the right to marry... Nobody said, hey, that's because of poverty and that's because of economic circumstances. You didn't hear anybody say that when it came to the ultra-Orthodox Jew who stabbed that person in the LGBT pride parade in Israel. Nobody said, hey, if this guy only had a better economic circumstance, if this guy only ha wasn't living in poverty, yada, yada, that, hey, he wouldn't have done that. Everybody kind of understood that those are two cases where, yeah, doctrine kind of explains it. They actually believed their shitty religions and then they acted on it, right? Yeah. And I think what people fear with you is that sometimes you over invoke, uh, you know, poverty and economic circumstances to explain action. And again, I'm making this point fully understanding sure. that there are cases where it is solely the, the political and economic circumstances that lead to action. Yeah, and there's, but there's also a big difference between having a bigoted view like Kim uh, Davis and then uh, wanting to blow yourself up, which is when my critiques of where religion and terrorism combined, and I guess that's what you're specifically referring to, you know, that's, that is a big difference. I can, you know, I can find you, you know, millions of Muslims who hold, you know, uh, Islamophobic, Islamophobic, uh, sorry, homophobic uh, ideas. 
Right. I, I can find you very, very few Muslims who are willing to blow themselves up. But those few who are willing to blow themselves up, it is always, without exception, um, except for maybe one or two or a handful of ISIS just loony bins who are drugged up and, and, and so forth before they do it. It is never involved for religion. I mean, Dawkins clearly in his book um, cites these Palestinians um, and he, he leaves out all of this stuff, the Palestinians, that when he interviewed yeah. their families about, uh, you know, Israeli oppression, Gaza, the blockade, being starved to death. I mean, you know, you, you know I've spent a lot of time in Palestine and in, uh, in the West Bank, um, not Gaza, but Israel. Every Palestinian you speak to, it, religion is never, uh, it's, this, this, this fight has nothing to do with religion. And when you're in Gaza and you're slowly being starved to death by a blockade and you're being humiliated every single day of your life, and you have no dignity. But for uh, these martyrs, when they're made a martyr, they have martyr weddings, they have martyr ceremonies, and they achieve dignity uh, at, when they decide that they're going to blow themselves to fight against the occupation that they would never you know, receive in real life. I mean, right. And this is how See, little we understand of West, you know, Islam and its effects on people who live in these societies. Right. So on this point, you and I are actually in total agreement. Um, when it comes to... So my, my go-to examples are the following. When it comes to the Palestinian territories and when it comes to Iran, I'm, I'm fine with saying that it's, mo it's overwhelmingly political uh, economic circumstances that have led to you know what you might say is an increase in favorability of suicide bombing and terrorism and all this different stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm 100% with you on those cases. Cool. But the counterpoint, though, CJ, which I think you would need to concede in order to for people to – you know, not mock you on this is <laughs> is to say, hey, when it comes to like the Gulf states, for example, mm -hmm. there are plenty of Gulf states where, uh, because of the oil wealth and the fact that the West is buying all the oil, uh, where the per capita income is actually pretty high, and they still have, and there's no, the U.S. has not invaded or done anything fucked up to them, and they hold these extremist uh, religious ideas, and they have jihadists come and speak at the biggest mosques, and. It, it, that has, in that case, it has very little to do with uh, Western intervention. Now, again, I concede and I totally agree with you, and I argue for it on my show time and time again that there are cases where it's almost all the fault of the West and, and intervention. But you have to concede that there are plenty of uh, fundamentalist uh, Islamists, you could say Wahhabists, who, without any action from the West whatsoever, could have been raised in that environment or latched onto that ideology, and they actually believe the doctrine. It's uh, you know I'm never going to 100 percent blame U.S. foreign policy. Of course, there's certainly instance you know Saudi Arabia. There's a good instance we made you know where Wahhabism was um, you right, know predates uh, us being the fucking yeah. assholes we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But almost everywhere. In, in, in almost every instance, without exception, nearly without exception, where you find radical Islam, you find the fingerprints of U.S. and U.K. intervention. It's interesting. I had a, 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 a really, you know, pleasant conversation. Yeah, I would just say in many. I would. My sorry to interrupt real quick, yeah. but my counterpoint is just I would just say in many of those circumstances. Yeah, well, even even in places where you might not even think. You know, I, I had a, you know I had a good chat with a guy called the the Chilean atheist, and he's a guy that's always. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah and uh, he's just one of those guys that has been slinging stuff at me on Twitter for years. And um, uh, but you know, we end up having a, a good conversation. He goes, but he goes, dude, what about Afghanistan? You know, uh, there you can't blame that on Western intervention. Well, we funded uh, the Mujahideen. Exactly. Mean. Thank you. And also, we <laughs> we turn, we turn that place into a war zone. And you know, where where you have a war zone, you have social chaos, or you have social chaos. You have gangs and warlords. You have to only go into the, the most economically depressed sub, in, you know, inner neighborhoods of America to find gangs and beheadings and mass shootings. And you know, we we taught the Afghanis how to hate the infidel. We taught them with the schools that we funded alongside the Saudis to, you know, when kids were, were learning how to count to ten, we counted, you know, uh, blowing up, you know, uh, Soviet tanks. Uh, yeah, we didn't learn our lesson either because in Syria, I don't know if you saw the story recently, but with uh, General Petraeus, he actually floated in a meeting that we should uh, consider arming, quote, moderate al-Qaeda members in yeah. order to topple Assad. Hey, so, I, wrote, you know, I wrote a piece about that for a Middle East side just recently. Yeah, uh, so – Unbelievable. You, and when it comes to foreign policy, I don't, I don't know what your overall – what you would say your overall position is, but I'm, I'm almost a, just a, a total – 
non-interventionist, I'd describe it. I think the only time the U.S. military should use force is in imminent cases of uh, self-defense. So, like, maybe the last intervention I would have done is World War Two, and then it would have been, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I, th- I think you and I are in total agreement on that, and I totally get the concept of blowback, and I've said time and time again, the war on terror, the opposite happened than what they said they wanted to happen. Oh, my God, we want to uh, limit or eliminate terrorism. Well, great, now there's more terrorists today, and you can directly tie that to your actions. You mm-hmm. made jihadists more popular. So you and I agree completely on that. But, but I think the only area but, but that, that's where okay, we disagree that, is I always – well, go ahead. I was going to say, and that's the key difference then between you and I and these new atheists because you almost no, – No, see, but there I disagree was, because no, I think most almost, are with us. And I think all, all, almost to a man – uh, new atheists believe that ISIS is the product of Islam and not the product of U.S. Destro- turning that place into Mad Max. No, dude, you're not talking to the right new atheist, man, i got to tell you. So I got this one guy, and I really want to introduce him to you, and perhaps you can even uh, do a podcast with him. So this guy was a former neo-Nazi, <laughs> and he, w- he was in prison. He ended up reforming himself by reading Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and all these different new atheist books. And today he's, you could call him a new atheist, but he's also a big time progressive. Like for example, he, he, he love, he loves Sam Harris, but to my critiques of Sam Harris recently on Israel, Palestine and on Iraq, he tweeted out that he thought my criticisms were correct. And I think that this guy is much more indicative of, of, uh, you know, what uh, new atheists are. In fact, he set, a, he set up a foundation now where it's a secular outreach program to rehabilitate drug addicts and people who are having problems in prison. I, I think that, that this kind of new atheist is the more common new atheist, where they might not be as vocal or as loud or as obnoxious online, but that's because, CJ, those are the ones who, when you say a lot of the things you say, they agree with you, so they're not coming after you. You know, you might get a tidal wave of hate on a whole bunch of stuff, and it's a very, you know, tiny minority that's really loud and, and obnoxious. So I think, I don't know, I just, I just, I, I hear from these guys all the time who love Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Noam Chomsky. And I just feel like that's much more indicative of the overall movement. Because think about it, man. If you're raised in a religious environment and you become an atheist, mm. chances are that person is pretty intelligent to deconvert themselves and get all the bullshit out of their head. So usually what goes hand in hand with that? Also being progressive, also being liberal, also being open-minded and tolerant. But, 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 and again, but, I get that. God, I was, I was going to say, but then, uh, particularly uh, these religious believers, who, you know, who come from a very fundamentalist uh, religious household, and they become an atheist, and they might go from agnosticism to atheism, and then, but when they cross over into new atheism slash AKA anti-theism, then they end up taking on the attributes of those that they oppose. Yeah. So, like I was, I was, I was kind of alluding to. Yeah. Um, I think. I think there are plenty of examples of that, man. And, but I just think the best way to describe them is far right atheists or conservative atheists, or because that's. I mean, I, again, I think that's the real dividing line here. And I don't want anybody. Like, I'm afraid, CJ, and I don't think you're doing this on purpose. But I'm afraid that, with how aggressive you are against the so-called new atheists, that a lot of people are not going to basically come out as atheists, and they have to stay in the closet, and they have to. Oh, not, no. they, they feel like they can't proselytize for their atheism, and I don't think e- evangelizing for atheism is a bad thing as long as you're just making rational arguments about why you think it's true. I, I'll, I'll challenge that. You know, the reason I wanted to write this book was the number of atheists who have come to me um, and the number of atheists who have said online as well, whether they've sent me personally emails, whether they've posted on my Facebook, whether they've posted on my Twitter, or they've written blog articles themselves that have found the new atheist movement and an embarrassment and are so repulsed by the rhetoric which is, you know, echoed by, you know, in their echoes of Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and Ian Hersey Ali and Bill Mayer, that they've put their atheism back into the closet. They're embarrassed to be atheists because of this evangelical atheist movement. Even John Gray and Alan, uh, Alain de Botton uh, have talked about that in their books too, how they've been savagely abused and attacked by new atheists by trying to inject some sort of kind of nuance um, take between atheism and religion, or trying to build a, a bridge between secular atheists and secular religious people. I mean, but, this, this is the thing—the point I keep trying to make to new atheists. You know, they can they can continue to pretend it's only me who's saying these things about them. It's not. So many atheists are coming out and identifying with the things I'm saying because it resonates true. Um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So, uh, 
let's be really specific here, though, because, again, I fear when you say, well, you list off all the atheists, it, it gives the impression that all of those people that you named agree on all the different policy positions. I think there are big differences. So, for example, I, I think uh, a guy like Bill Maher is probably the least offender of the different policy ideas that you would despise. I think a guy like Richard Dawkins is one of the lesser offenders. Now, when you get to people like, and I know I'll get shit for this, but I've spoken about this before, and I'm on the record about this. When you get to people like Christopher Hitchens and you get to people like Ion Hirsi Ali, there are, I, I, I think they're more cons- conservative than the others, and I disagree with them more, and I talk about them more, and you know, I have issues with them, big issues with them. But uh, to get back to one of my main points here, don't you see how it, I don't think it's accurate to just represent them as new atheists, period. And then, and then, you know, you give the impression that they're all kind of crazy, crazy people, bad people, wrong people. When a guy like Bill Maher has been clear from day one, he's a non-interventionist through and through. Every argument that you've made in terms of why the Iraq war was bad, in terms of why the U.S. should stop meddling in other people's business, Bill Maher was there making that argument in the 1990s on politically incorrect. Yeah, but, and he's but, still making them today. But, but Bill Maher is also a guy that said there are too many Muhammads in the West, and also because of his anti-theistic, particularly anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim views, he sees the world through that prism. And so when he sees Israel-Palestine, he praises Netanyahu, he supports the Gaza invasion and intervention because he believes, you know, he said, you know, there's, well, there's no gay bars in Gaza, so that for some reason becomes a justification to turn that place into a moonscape. I yeah, mean, so I, again, on that point, I absolutely disagree with Bill Maher, and I've done I've done segments about it. I've done sure. segments about it where you know I've actually praised Reza Aslan for standing up to to Bill on when he was on the show when it comes to the issue of Israel Palestine. But this is but again to go back to to my main point here. So I have no problem, and I do it. I dis- disagree with him on that point, and I go into it. But the idea that he's part of some gigantic you know evil plot or conspiracy here, where he's akin to or just as bad as fundamentalist Christians or fundamentalist Muslims, and you have made that point over and over that, you know, you you view new atheists as uh, akin to the Christian right. I just think that's empirically not well, well, uh, true, and even you know that's untrue, because look at the percentage that you would agree with a guy like Bill Maher on. You agree with him on over 80% of shit to say that he's like somebody like John Hagee or Pat Robertson. It's just not correct. Well, Ch- Chomsky made that view, uh, that, that, that view too. He said that they're the secular version of the Christian right. Um, and he's an yeah, Chomsky himself. has referred to them as fundamentalists, and yeah. as much as I love Noam Chomsky, that's a, <laughs> that's uh, I, I disagree with him on that. And I also, I mean, I I have other disagreements with Chomsky. I, I kind of I think he's to the left of me on economic issues, but in terms of U.S. foreign policy, I think Chomsky's pretty much spot on. But I'll, I'll come back to the point of you know lumping you know the, the point you're making of uh, of lumping progressive atheists in with um, uh, conservative atheists. Now you again you take someone. It's it's where on Islam that these people lose their shit. You know, you know Dawkins, he's a liberal. You know, no one would argue he's anything you know to the contrary, but a liberal. But he loses his mind when it comes to Islam, and he loses his mind when it comes to his what I believe is a blind hatred of Muslims. Now, when you when it, straight after Charlie Hebdo attack, he tweets out that you know an act of terrorism, something along that lines of well, when it's an act of terrorism, I don't need to tell you the religious identity of the person who committed the terrorist attack. You know, not only is he blind to the fact that the word terrorism is a is an arbitrary term, and it's a you know it's a term that we don't give to our own terrorist activities. We're committing one of the right, worst. Yeah. We're, we're we're committing one of the worst terrorist acts in history in Yemen at the moment, which gets no media press. Um, you well, know, it's Saudi Arabia with our guns, basically. and when we're guiding the bombs in um, with our satellites and and so forth. Um, and so we, we don't ascribe um, terrorism to state violence. We don't ascribe terrorism to, to our own violence. And Muslims aren't the only group of individuals committing terrorist acts, you know, around the world. Um, and so th- th- he's blinded then to two just basic realities, the definition of terrorism and the fact that Muslims aren't the, the sole, you know, owners of, uh, of whatever you want to describe terrorism is. Yeah, if you remember my ceasefire video, this was one of the points that I made to you know the 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 famous new atheist where i said i think you'd get a lot of people off your back if you uh, you know were able to recognize that like they they'll never ever ever tweet something about uh christian terrorism or right wing terrorism which happens all the time in the us mm-hmm. and they'll they'll never talk yeah. about how like and sec- you make the point that state state terrorism, terrorism is is te- exactly state terrorism is terrorism if if you 
you know, just because you have an army behind what you're doing doesn't mean that the logic is sound and doesn't mean that, you know, when you kill civilians, it's okay. So, yeah, you're right. I think they do, on this point, I think they are a little off when it comes to uh, <laughs> understanding terrorism. Um, but again, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think that uh, if you bring these points up to them, that they they'll like double down and be like, no, it's all it's all the Muslims. Well, and then you could just point out, like I pointed out, I think in the ceasefire video, I think I pointed out, did I point out statistics in that video? If I didn't, I've done videos on that before where I point out sure. all the different, uh, you know, statistics on but, terrorism in the U.S. Fifty six percent of terrorist attacks or attempted terrorist attacks or are, are right wing terrorist attacks. And the list goes on. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, and, and part of that, what's built into to that in a way that, and you know, even progressive new atheists, even though I, I still hold my turn, that's a contradictory in terms. But uh, even the ones you want to describe then uh, is a better way to phrase it. The people you describe as progressive new atheists, um, they still evangelize Western civilization. They do okay, see, the, the, this the, is good because we disagree big time on this point. Go ahead. Okay, so they, they really do persist. A, a dichotomy between the civilized Western world and the barbaric Orient, the barbaric and the barbaric Eastern world, and there is no evidence to suggest the contrary that we treat life with any greater sanctity than those we bomb, no, occ no. occupy, and belittle. But the point that they're making when they make that point is very simply: Hey, we think that it makes sense to uh, allow gay marriage and treat gays equally. Hey, we think it makes sense to treat women 100% equally and not tell them they have to cover up. Hey, we think it makes sense that uh, to, to believe in civil liberties and have due process. We think it's crazy to chop off somebody's head if they are accused of sorcery or witchcraft or any of that. So when they're making that point, I, I agree with you, CJ, if you're making the point that, hey, the ends don't justify the means, so you can't use illiberal tactics to implement liberal values. I agree with you 100% on that point. But when I think when they make that point that, oh, you know, Western values or liberal values is superior, what they're really saying is the argument I laid out here where they're basically saying it's not just a different society if, if, so, if they don't believe in free speech in said society. It is empirically worse because believing in free speech is a superior thing. Having policies that allow free speech is superior. I think that's the point that they're making, and I think that's a point you actually agree with. Yeah, but, but there's, there's a thing. When you become a Western civilization evangelist, you exaggerate the crimes of the other and you pretend our crimes don't happen. And yeah, sometimes, it, sometimes I think that's true. I don't and, think it's true in all cases because I think I'm somebody who actually believes liberal values are flat out superior. And I wouldn't do that, but I do think that in many cases you're right, that sometimes that leads to a downplaying of, well, when we do something wrong, we mean well, <laughs> but when they do something wrong, well, I mean, that's indicative of who they are. That's just how they are. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is, you know, you only have to go to um, the Twitter feeds. If, the, if a Muslim is killed in a faraway land, uh, sorry, if a, if a secularist is killed away in a faraway land by a Muslim, then the new atheist Twitter timelines light up on fire. But when we commit atrocities, there's almost universal silence. When the CIA torture report came out, none of the new atheist celebrities that you could pick were uh, made a, a mention of it. When a, a new, when the Lancet study came out showing that you know Western wars now have led to the deaths of four million Muslims in the Middle East since 1990, there's universal silence on this. When you know, it, and that's that's the point. You. We only have the ability to change our own policies. We only have the, build, you know, the ability to change who we are and, and right our wrongs. And again, Chomsky makes that point. Talking about you know, uh, crimes which are happening uh, in other countries where we have no control over the political dynamics, particularly because these are autocratic, despotic uh, regimes, makes as much sense ethically as criticizing something that happened in the 16th century. And yeah, so uh, the, the, I actually the, the, the fault the fault is in our stars, De Brutus is a line from you know Shakespeare. Yeah, I actually I agree with you know what you would call the uh, the the Chomsky rule. I had uh, Professor Gad Sod on my show, and I you know I kind of try to lay that out for him what the Chomsky rule is, and I told him I kind of believe in the Chomsky rule, and the general idea behind that is like you said. You should criticize your own government's wrongs first because you are responsible for them. It's your tax dollars that are funding it, so it only makes sense to do that. And the counterargument a lot of people have is just, well, no, you should really just focus on where you think the worst wrongs are uh, first, regardless of where they're coming from. But I agree with you that I think that that leaves the, ta that leaves the taste of condescension 
and arrogance and bigotry a little bit because people think like, well, what the fuck, man? You got a lot of fucked up shit going on that you're doing, but you're going to, you know, criticize besides some fucked up shit happening somewhere else. But the way I look at it overall is I believe in the Chomsky rule and I do criticize my government first and I do try to correct those wrongs because I have the ability to. But I don't limit myself, and this is where I think some people go wrong here, CJ, is that I don't limit myself as a matter of principle to only exposing the wrongs of the American government or all these different things. And so like when the secular bloggers were hacked to death in Bangladesh, of course I covered those stories. And of course I said that this is an outrage and this shouldn't happen and we should try to stop this. Not we being, you know, the West. I'm not in favor of a military intervention in Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. But just again, in the realm of ideas, you try to fight back against fundamentalist religious people and try to win there. Well, my, you know, and again on Bangladesh, and I, I make this point in my, in my book, is, um, you know, we're up in arms about one or two bloggers who get uh, killed in, uh, and murdered in uh, Bangladesh. But U.S. corporations under free trade agreements with Bangladesh are set up in that country in working conditions where are so bad, where Bangladeshis commit suicide at work, are injured and maimed without pay at work, are paid so little they can't afford the, the, the you know, to survive, basically, all for the benefit of pumping dollars back into our country. Crit- and, criticize that because you can change policy and you will save more Bangladeshi see, lives. But CJ, 90% of new atheists who just heard you say that agree with you. They think that that's wrong, we shouldn't have those, those sweatshops. So I think the reason why a lot get but, mad at you but is... But they're silent on it. Because, well, but they don't know about it because the media sucks and they don't cover it. The only place they're going to get that information is if they watch secular talk. And all the people <laughs> who are watching it, you know, then they hear about it and, they, and those are the people who are the progressive new atheists. So they end up criticizing all these terrible so-called free trade deals that outsource jobs and have slave labor. They end up criticizing all the ridiculous aspects of U.S. foreign policy. They end up criticizing all of that stuff. And then also on top of that, they have no bones about saying, hey, look at these verses in the Quran. Look at these verses in the Bible. Look at these verses in all these holy books. It's untrue and it's dangerous that any, anybody believes them. And by the way, just I know we don't have much time left, so I just want to mm-hmm. uh, ask you – do you think that – so here's you know, my general thing on, on religion is as a general rule, not to get into any specifics with all the different holy books and stuff, but as a general rule with a lot of religions, you have at least 50% of the scripture, the holy book, is just out and out silliness or f- flat-out savagery. Don't you think there's value in taking time and, and putting effort into saying – Hey guys, come on, it's 2015, let's be reasonable here. No, you're not a bad person if you identify with religion X, Y, or Z, and no, we're not going to force you to not be religious, that's ridiculous. But, in so far as we actually care about things that are true, and we're really searching for the facts of reality here, mm-hmm. don't you think it makes sense for every you know reasonable person to kind of say, alright guys, there's an error in this coding, which is very dangerous, which could lead the wrong people to do violence in the name of religion X, Y, or Z, we should all kind of move away from that and be more agnostic or atheist or just secular. I, 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 I'm 100% uh, behind criticizing religious doctrine and criticizing you know, uh, dangerous tenets of dangerous belief where you find in whether it's the Bible or the Quran. But you have to do it in an in a intellectual you know. Uh, scholarly way, and 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 this is the point that you know I get so frustrated with, with Harris, and I brought it up before. Kill the infidel doesn't mean what it, it you know uh, it means on the surface when you read in the Quran. I know, but uh, CJ, a lot of a, Muslims think it does, man. A lot and, of Muslims and that's think problem. it does. Exactly, and that's the problem. And and we should be. And I'll, I'll use an anecdote. Um, apostasy that doesn't mean the same thing in, in the Quran as people think it does. That was a, apostasy basically means the same thing in a purely military sense. What we would call treason. We used to kill people for treason not that long ago, and that's what apostasy means. But isn't that still stupid? It's it's too yeah. We, we we only just stopped killing people for treason, but it doesn't mean what ISIS thinks it means, and it doesn't what mean what New Atheists thinks it means. And I'll, I'll use an anecdote here. Uh, Mubin Sheikh is a former jihadist, and he wrote a book called The Undercover Jihadi, and he was a guest. He's been a guest a couple of times in, on my podcast, and he's just a great fella. He's a guy that became uh, uh, grown up very conservative um, Muslim household in Canada. Uh, went to uh, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, became radicalized by the Taliban uh, in Quetta uh, there came back to America and then had this very anti-American, very anti-Western ideas, very pro-Taliban way of thinking. And then he went, he's, he's, he's gone, right, I need to know more about these religious texts. 
But he was going there from the frame point, I need to study deeply, a holistic, deep understanding what the Quran says, so basically I can justify my worldview. But he was going there to justify his jihad. Um, so he spent two years in Syria. He learned Arabic. Um, he, he had one of the top Islamic scholars. Um, uh, he was taught the Quran there. And when he was taught the contextual meaning of jihad, the contextual meaning of kill the infidel, the contextual meaning of apostasy, he went, holy fucking shit, I was so wrong on this. The Taliban are completely backwards on this. ISIS are completely backwards on this. What, and, we, and, and so the, basically a holistic contextual understanding of the Quran is what de-radicalized him. And that's just not a one-off anecdote. When you read Mark Sadman's study into the Al-Qaeda terrorists and their um, associates and their affiliates and the people, you know, uh, involved in, at a multi-layer level in behind the 9-11 attacks, he came to the conclusion, what we should be using, we should be using a deep understanding of the Quran because that is probably the number one tool we have to de-radicalize uh, jihadist terrorists. But CJ, don't you want understand that that's it. so you and I can sit there and have uh, conversations with absolutely lovely Christians like Martin Luther King Jr. somebody I mean obviously we can't talk to him he's dead but you get my point <laughs> we can talk, we can have conversations with people like that like there are plenty of absolutely lovely people in all the different religions out there and I don't deny that they can explain to you in gr great detail a good interpretation of their holy book but my problem with that is CJ, it's a holy book. There's no interpretation that is right or wrong. All, and even Rez Aslan says this. Anybody who calls themselves a Muslim is a Muslim. Anybody who has an interpretation of a holy book, that's their interpretation of the holy book. Now, I agree with you that in order to win in the realm of ideas, we need to hope that all of the different liberal, open-minded interpretations of all the different holy books win. But that doesn't change the ultimate the fact that there are plenty of people who can read a passage and and say no this is violent and i should do violent violence in the name of my religion so my main point is since you have have a, a sheet of paper with words on it <laughs> and to use vague numbers here fifty percent of the time it can be used for evil fifty percent of the time it can be used for good isn't the whole premise the problem isn't the axiom the problem the idea that any one book should ha should dictate how you should act, what you should do, and you should base your life on it or your philosophy on it. I think that's profoundly anti-intellectual, and I think you know that, and everybody else knows that, and we're just playing weird mental gymnastic games okay. when we try to say only the positive interpretations of the different holy books matter. No, no, but no, no it's, it's, all the interpretations no, it's, matter, it's and not, some of them are bad. It's not, it's not it's not just simply calling it a positive interpretation. It's the right it's the the right interpretation. Now, no, we, no, we, no, we, no, we, no, we said, no, let, let me finish this point. We, we have a choice here. You, you've basically you know, presented us with a choice. Do we, as Movement Sheikh and Mark Sageman suggest, uh, do we tell most uh, people like ISIS and jihadists, and go, you know what, you're completely fucked up when you think kill the infidel means kill uh, uh, you know, non-Sunni Muslims, non tukfiri Muslims, uh, atheists, pagans, you name it. You've completely misinterpreted what Muhammad meant in that specific text. Or do we tell these people, you know what, ISIS, you know what, Al-Qaeda, You've got it spot on. In fact, as Sam Harris has called you, you're the most pious Muslims. Big thumbs up. Go for it, fellas. That's the choice we're faced with. No, no, no. But CJ, they're attacking the problem from two different angles. So you're right that that argument might be an effective one, and it could work if other Muslims make that argument to the fundamentalists. Of course, and I'm for them doing that. But when atheists stand up and say, well, wait a second, there's a really negative reading of that as well, so you should drop the whole thing. That's just another way of attacking the problem. It, it might not be as effective. I might agree with you on that. I don't. I, maybe I won't create as many, you know, uh, atheists or non-religious people as some moderate Muslim would create moderate Muslims by using their argument. But we're still, in essence, going after the same problem. Yep. Yep. I agree, man. And uh, this is why I wanted you having the show. I, I, without pissing in your pot, <laughs> pissing in your pocket, this for me has been the most enjoyable podcast of all the 42 episodes i've done uh oh, thanks man that means a lot i like hearing that yeah, <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was a great conversation yeah man i this is what you know this is what um you know i love this is the debate of ideas and and um and i, and I want people to know that about my book my book isn't to damage atheism i you know i've i've i, I was a new atheist I've identified a problem. I think I've articulated the problem I think is in there, there is among certain uh, atheists. I'm not alone in thinking that. I'm trying to make atheism more appealing to people. I'm not trying to damage atheism, as some people have accused me of doing. And, you know, and 
if I can have conversations like I just had with you with other people, I think we can all help make atheism more appealing. Yeah, I uh Yeah, I mean I I I I agree. I mean, I think we it, it annoys me to no end when I see people who are really far right on the political spectrum uh advocating a atheism cuz i think no like <laughs> you know you wrote a book atheists can't be republicans that's yeah. kind of spot on i mean i always think especially if you were raised in a religious household and you kind of deconverted yourself and you learned <laughs> i how can you be a, a a republican typically when people are are really interested in in this issue that we're discussing usually i think they kind of get into other political issues and stuff like that and you know they typically they would be open minded there as well and they come to the right conclusions there as well. I, I definitely agree with your overall thesis when you say, "Hey, man, if you uh, liberalism is in many respects the solution to many fundamentalist communities." I think that's true because usually, I, I think it's fair to say, when you have people with economic opportunity and decent standards of living, they're not going to turn to fundamentalism. I don't think it's true 100 percent of the time, but I think it definitely would decrease the number of fundamentalists in all different religions and i think that's a, a great way to attack the problem yeah no absolutely mate spot on well said and uh, mate, for, for my listeners uh who aren't familiar with you where's the best place they can find you they can just go to uh youtube.com slash secular talk and they'll see a trillion and one videos there and uh hopefully they'll be entertained by them <laughs> oh, mate, i've watched a few and uh, mate, i can guarantee they'll be entertained <laughs> so <laughs> mate, uh, kyle uh awesome chat mate and uh and great having you on i hope this uh uh, we get to do this again very soon. Thanks again, man. I appreciate it.